Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of Ask Wada. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala nabihi wa mustafa sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa ba'd. All praises due to Allah alone. We praise him and we seek his help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves us say, none can show him guidance. May the greatest peace and salutations be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My dear brothers, it has been a long time since we met last day of Ramadan. It was a long vacation and now we're resuming all our live programs by the grace of Allah. May Allah accept from all of us. And I assume by now, Alhamdulillah, if guys uh, fasted uh, the six days of Shawwal, hopefully, uh, or those of you who didn't uh, fast them yet, at least they were able to make up the missed days and they will start, we still have, uh, mashallah, maybe less than a couple weeks, uh, maybe 13 days. So you have a chance to fast the six days of Shawwal, inshallah. We'll talk about all of that. And meanwhile, allow me to remind you with our contact informations, beginning with the phone numbers. Area code 001-361-489-1503. Alternatively, a record 001-347-80625. These are two WhatsApp numbers, and we have also two local numbers. All the phone numbers are to be used for phone calls only. Uh, please do not send any text messages. Some people, when they send uh, messages, whether WhatsApp messages or text messages, they expect uh, an answer, and this is not feasible for the time being. The local numbers are code 002, then 01005469323, and finally are code 002, then 0238555134. Assalamu alaikum, our first caller for Sister Amatullah from the USA. Welcome to Ask Oda. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amatullah, how are you? Um, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, one is about fasting even though ramadan is over i still would like an answer um in a few days i'll be seven seven six years old and so far i'm able to fast even though i have a, a blood sugar problem but i, I don't have diabetes mm. and sometimes when i'm fasting of course I, i'm retired i'm able to fast for what i'm uh, Sister Amatullah, uh, Sister Amatullah, yeah. your phone call started perfect, but now we're losing you. Your voice is breaking off. I even didn't hear exactly. You said you are seventy what? Seventy. Masha Allah. May Allah grant you a good life and good deeds. So, um, let me try. Your question is about fasting. What is your question? I. I do have a blood sugar problem, but I have found ways to eat carefully uh, during the non-fasting hours so that I could fast, and alhamdulillah, that's worked. But I noticed in the last couple of years that sometimes in the evening when I break my fast, even when I have like a little soup or something besides the sweet, like um, besides dates, I can only eat one date now or I'll get sick. But even after eating regular food, I still feel a little strange or... Anyway, my question is, I don't feel good even when I eat now. <laughs> so I, I don't, but I don't want to commit a sin or, you know, do anything wrong. I know if you're sick, you can make up your days later. But would I be wrong if I can kind of push through it and I think I'm okay? Um, would it be wrong if, if it somehow is making my blood sugar worse or I'm harming myself in some way? All right. Do you have another question, Amatullah? Uh, yeah, it's totally unrelated. But um, I know someone who isn't practicing Islam. And um, I, if, I'm hoping that she decides to back. 
But if she does, and it's kind of known, it's not widely known that she isn't practicing, but a few people know, a few people in this town know. Um, so then would she have to say Shahada publicly again, or could she privately just decide it or something? All right. To I got your questions, Sister Thank Amatullah. You. You're most welcome. Let's see if we have uh, callers on the line to take their questions. Or I'll be more than happy to start answering. Uh, um, let's take Abdul Qadir from India. Assalamu alaikum, Abdul Qadir. Wa alaikum salam. Go ahead, Akhi. Uh, so, yeah, I was a Sufi and I changed my Akida. Okay. Uh, now, uh, now I have doubts in what things makes kufr and. Uh, uh, so I, I have was was uh, okay I got your question do you have another one yeah. uh, then I have was was in uh, Salah also I unintentionally break Salah I have serious OCD what should I do I don't know Fine. got your questions Abdul Qadir from India sister Amatullah from the USA when it comes to the ability to fast due to health issues, right away, deen, religion, sharia says consult your doctor. So you're not diabetic, alhamdulillah. And the doctor says, you're perfect. You can fast, you can afford it, and it's actually healthy for you. Bismillah. Feeling strange due to long day of fasting, maybe a little bit dehydrated, whatever. This is normal for everyone, okay? But if your doctor says due to other health conditions, you're not advised to fast. And it must be a Muslim doctor to know exactly your circumstances as a Muslim. What is the significance of fasting in addition to your health condition? So when you ask a sheikh, the sheikh will say, what did your doctor say? Well, doctor said you're not diabetic, you're, hyper, you're not hyper nor hypotensive, you can fast. In this case, whenever it is Ramadan, you should fast. Age by itself, 69, 79, 80, unless if the person is unable to fast, failing to fast, fainting, getting severely dehydrated, affecting their health condition. In this case, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ in this case, go ahead and feed one miskin because you have reached the limit where it is kind of not expected to improve or to be better in the future. So your health condition will remain like that, like a chronic patient. So in this case, each day you skip its fasting, mashallah, you feed one miskin and that's it. A woman or a man who is not practicing Islam, whether by declaring that I don't think Islam is a true religion has become a kafir immediately or by refusing to do any of the commandment of the Islamic teaching such as salah and fasting right away he or she have chosen to come out of the fall of Islam now they want to return back to Islam somebody who was in praying somebody who was in fasting do I have to go to the masjid and declare that I've come back to Islam a shahada is something between you and Allah if you say it between you and Allah it counts if she declares it between you and Allah and in front of you, perfect, no problem, okay? But if a person said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, mu'minan biha, mukhlisan biha qalbu, out of belief and with sincere devotion, they really believe in its meaning, they are believers even if they didn't say that in public. And I highly urge any person before uh, the end of Ramadan, we had a caller, once we opened the episode, she said, I would like to become a Muslim. She said, repeat after me, right away, say the kalima. Then we will talk later about all the details. Why? Because since no one knows when, where, and how will they die, death may happen at any time. I would rather die as a believer after saying the kalima so that I will be saved according to the hadith of the young Jew who serving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdul Qadir from India. He said he was practicing Sufism, then he corrected his Aqeedah, and he has a lot of doubts. OCD, right now he visits a psychiatrist and follow 
the regimen, take that prescription on a regular basis, the medication, and do also the sessions in order to recover and become better in that condition. Clinical treatment is required. With regards to whatever comes across your mind due to whispers, it doesn't affect your faith. Alhamdulillah, you're a believer. You are a believer. Whenever it is in the salah or in the wudu, I advise you to record yourself a few times on your phone, video, camera, and you realize that, Alhamdulillah, I don't have a problem. It's all in my mind, but it is not real. So keep doing what you're doing and neglect the waswasa. Just if it happens in the salah, everybody, whether you are, you are an OCD patient or a normal person, but it just happens, so as the Prophet ﷺ said to one of his companions, it will be sufficient for you to turn to your left side like this and blow thrice, then say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. If it is waswasa from Satan, he will run away and will leave you alone. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Maryam from the UK, welcome to Ask Ula Maryam. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I hope you're all right. I'm doing great, um, alhamdulillah. Question, Thank you for asking. Go ahead. Okay. My question is on the female-initiated divorce. Mm. So the first question I have is, during the one-month waiting period, what rights does the husband have on the soon-to-be ex-wife in terms of maybe intimacy or, you know, commanding her and telling her she has to do some things? And mm. my second question is, in the UK, one question at a time, Sister Maria. One question at a time. When you say you, uh, in case of the wife initiating the divorce, then basically you're talking about khula. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. In this case, this is similar to ba in talaq, irreversible talaq, unless if the wife agrees, then after idda or whatever, it would require a new marriage contract. So accordingly, even if the husband says, hey, honey, let's go and share bed, and you want to, you can't, because it has become irreversible because it was initiated by you. It's khula. Next question, please. Okay, so during that um, divorce in the UK, apart from the money that the ex-husband is supposed to be paying for the upkeep of the children, there is something else that you can ask for during the regular divorce, which is the marital asset, like you get some money paid from whatever your husband's um, financial strength is. So is this money allowed in Islam, knowing that if it's a female initiated divorce, you have to return your dowry. So this type of money is this something that we are allowed to also take from the husband, which is not the money that is for the children's maintenance? Okay. A woman who is looking after the children and she has the custody, she's also entitled for support, financial support. So, in this case, since you're looking after the children, you need some sort of financial support that is also due on the husband. So this is legitimate though. As far as in the case of the wife initiating divorce and khula, it's based on their mutual agreement. Yani, the husband may say, you keep your dowry. You don't want me, I don't want you. You keep your dowry, you keep all your hukuk, all your money. So. Even though it is khul, but he didn't mind not taking back the money that he gave you as a dowry. As a dowry. But the money that was spent on you during the marriage is not to be returned. It's not refundable. It is only the dowry that he gave you and the gifts, valuable gifts in order to marry you. But after divorce, whether it is khula or whether it is a regular divorce, if you are having the custody and you're looking after the children, so there is child support and you, because you're looking after them and raising them uh, or breastfeeding the babies, then you're also eligible and entitled for financial support. How much? That would be depending on the capacity of the husband. وَعَلَى الْمَوْلُودِ لَهُ رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ 
based on a reasonable basis. So somebody's income is uh, 4K and he can afford to give you 2K because you're looking after the children. Okay, that's why there should be a Muslim council and I know in the UK there is. Uh, Sheikh Haytham Haddad, Dr. Sajid Umar and others, uh, you know, so they will decide how much you're making, then this is how much you should pay as child support. This is better than uh, going to the court and sometimes forging evidences in order to get something which is not yours. Thank you, Sister Mariam. Do you have another question? Yes, just the last one now. Do you have any um, advice and what, um, or prayers when somebody is taking this type of huge step that you recommend? Uh, my only advice is before the prayers and before what you do, the Almighty Allah says, "In khibtum shiqaqa bainihima, fabghathu hakam min ahlihi, wa hakam min ahliha. I yurida islahan, yuwafq Allah bainahuma." Sister, before taking the initiative and before you deciding on your own or online or listening to some friends that this guy is a monster, you deserve better and you will be doing much better without him. Would you please follow the divine guidance in this regard? Counseling. Try counseling. So counseling is either through an arbitration, a representative from his side and another one from your side, wise people who would sit and talk and listen to both of you, see if it is reconcilable, resolvable or not. And they will give you the uh, wise advice. Or uh, you resort to uh, marriage counseling where also he must be a marriage Muslim counselor faqih who would hear you all the way and hear him and see sometimes and in many cases when I visited the UK and I sit with the couple the differences based upon the woman have decided that I don't want him were resolved in the same setting either the guy acknowledged said I'm sorry I didn't know and I was wrong or he was uh, kind of exaggerated in the mind of either one of them so this is my advice to you. Try counseling before you take the initiative. Thank you, Sister Mariam from the UK. Brother Abdul Hamid from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah, Abdul Hamid. Right before you, the question was about divorce, khul and so on. So perhaps you look for another question though. Go ahead. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I heard all the answer and it, it, it actually answered part of the question I was going to ask you later on. But my main question, I mean, in fact, this is not like a question, but it's a comment. I saw your video with Dr. Nike and I was really amazed with that video. I made dua for both of you. Which video? Really Which video? Uh, we Dr. have Nike. many of them. The fun one? Yeah, the one, the one you were making tea, the one Dr. Nike was teaching you how to make tea. He was making tea, I wasn't. <laughs> I drank the tea. He made me yeah. drink it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, second part of my question is that on mortgage, um, there is something called partnership. Some company in the UK here, they do a partnership whereby they sell the house to you let's say they sell the house for $200,000 and £200,000 and then you pay £25,000. So the rest you're supposed to pay instrumentally over a period of time which both of you agreed on. But you will not be able to make a full payment of whatever is left from the £200,000 maybe 10 years later. They will have to revalue the house if you want to buy the whole uh, the remaining balance of what you paid previously, if you want to buy it 10 years later, they will have to revalue it and sell it for you for that amount. So I'm asking the question that what happened to my rent that I paid over um, over the period of 10 years and the £20,000 that I initially deposited at the first, uh, the first time I made the payment. Is this halal or is this still river? Okay. Well, basically, you're sharing with me a format that I'm not aware of. What I'm aware of is that when I pay 25%, then this is my position. This is my share. I own one quarter of the house. And then periodically, while making payment towards the rent, the rent for the 75% of the house, every year or couple years, 
we reevaluate the house and see how much I'm willing to buy out of that. So if I'm willing to buy another 25%, then the next I'm going to pay rent for only 50%. This is a legitimate, a legitimate transaction. Why? Because I and the bank, I and the landlord have become partners with different percentage in the ownership. And basically I'm renting his share. Whenever I can afford to buy his entire share or part of it, I give an offer based on the market value and I buy it. If I buy the entire share, then the entire house is mine and I don't end up paying any rent. But if I cannot afford and only buy a certain percentage, then the remaining percentage I would have to pay rent for it. Also the market value and so on. Is that clear? This transaction, this transaction is lawful. The one which I listed uh, by the end. Brothers and sisters, it is actually time to take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second segment. Our phone number should appear on the bottom of your screen and we have sister Layla from Belgium. Assalamu alaikum sister Layla. Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray that you're doing well inshallah. Alhamdulillah I am. Thank you for asking. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your family and all your colleagues at Huda TV Amen. and grant you all the fiddles. Amin ya Rabbi. Amin. Same to you. That's very Amin, nice Sheikh. of you. Amin. Jazakallah khairan. Forgive me, ya Sheikh. Uh, I don't really have a question uh, regarding something specific, but I rather have a, a small request if possible, inshallah. Um, my dear uncle passed away yesterday morning. Allah irhamu wa sali. Inna lillahi And I would like to ask... And I would like to ask, and I would truly appreciate it if you and all the viewers could make a du'a for him, but not only for him, for all our Muslim brothers and sisters that have returned back to Allah. Subhanahu what is his name, Layla? What was his name? His name is Abdus. His name is Abdus Salam. May Allah have mercy on your uncle Abdus Salam. May Allah admit him to the gardens of paradise. May Allah send him to al firdaus Al-A'la in the company of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the martyrs and the righteous. May Allah pardon him and forgive him all his sins. May Allah make his grave a garden of paradise. Ameen and may Allah have mercy on all Muslims who passed away. Thank you uh, Layla for calling in and for asking us to pray for your uncle. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Misha from Canada, welcome to Ask Uda Misha. Thank you, Zazakallah Khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, how are you? Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone for doing this such a great show where we can actually you know, have caution and have, you know, whatever we have, we can figure it out how, how to deal with our life. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Do you have a question? My father. Yes, yes. I do. Bismillah. What is your question? Uh, I'll be try to as quick as possible. Um, I have issue with my husband, my father. Uh, my parents were separated and divorced when I was a child. I never been with them. I never been lived with them. I all I grew up with my grandparents and with my uncle. Um, now I'm old enough. I have kids. I got married. Uh, my father is not financially stable. I try to help him as much as possible, but he has issue every time I want to, uh, you know, contact with my mother. He doesn't like when I do that. So every time he figures out or finds out that I, I am in contact with my mom, um, or if I give my mom a little preferred or preference or priority than him he would not talk to me he would stop talk to me for like a year or something it's been going on for whole whole life and I'm right now kind of not sure how to deal with this and I was helping him financially whenever he needed me 
but right now at a point he doesn't talk to me if I don't want to talk to him and I don't know how to deal with this situation in future. I'm just kind of needed advice from you. Okay, thank you, uh, Misha from Canada. First of all, my advice to a couple who are separated for a reason or another, that they should not put any pressure on their children to sever their ties with the other party. This is absolutely forbidden. So if I have a commandment from Allah and a desire of my father or my mother, either one of whom who says, don't talk to your father, don't talk to your mother, I ain't listening to them and I shouldn't be listening to them. This is not permissible. My mother have rights upon me, the same like my father exactly, whether they are separated or they are still married. Accordingly, in order to play right, then take care of both of them without having to inform either one of them that you're visiting the other party or helping them financially or even making any mention of them before them. It is very unfortunate, but some human beings are like that. So try to reconnect with your father, take some nice gifts and help him financially because he's eligible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and increase your provision, you and your husband, and bless your family. And once you connect, don't even make mention of your mother before him whatsoever. As you said that they have been separated since your childhood. Uh, it is really amazing how the Quran describes marriage and also describes divorce. And holding or divorcing when he says, فَإِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ when he says, فَأَمْسِكُهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ فَارِقُهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ The word معروف, kindness. معروف, gentleness. معروف is a beautiful word. Not because we're divorced, we turn to become enemies. Not because we're divorced, we should charge our children against each other. But some people are uneducated or they're very prejudiced for a reason or another. In this case, the children have to play smart, uphold the ties of both, support them financially both, love them both equally, yet don't inform either one of them, especially the one who gets offended if he or she were to know that you're taking care of your other parent. Don't, you don't have to tell them. If you know that not a chance, don't tell them. Just take care of each one separately. May Allah make it easy for you, Misha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Fatima from the Philippines. Abu, Abu Fatima from the Philippines, welcome to Ask God, Abu Fatima. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Abu Fatima. May Allah preserve you upon Iman, Sheikh. Ameen, ameen, same to you. Thank you. What is your question? Sheikh, my question is, uh, someone gave me money to prepare iftar meal for the entire Ramadan and we made calculation for a hundred people per day. Now after Ramadan some of the money is left and I was wondering whether I should return the money to the person or can I keep the money? No, you cannot keep any money. It's not yours. And the money was directed towards giving iftar for fasting people. You still have some left over. You hand it over, you give it back to the person who donated it. He can donate it later on for another Ramadan or another gathering in the masjid, but the money is not yours. Al-waqfu ala niyyat al-waqf. A very common mistake. A very common mistake. Even some shiukh imams in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, they fall in, which is when they raise funds for a particular reason. And then that cause is supported and there is some money left so they can redirect it on their own. If even they redirect it for another cause, that is not permissible. Because I as a donor said, when you said that, well, this is purely for orphans. You know, a lot of people were orphaned uh, after the earthquake. So I'm giving you $100 for the orphans. Can I take the money towards building a masjid somewhere else? No, you can't. My money, I donated it towards a particular cause. I did not allow you to redirect it towards building a hospital or a school. It's none of your business. 
If this is not permissible, then can you imagine saying, well, I collected this money and now it is mine because we already uh, took care of the business. I can keep that is for me major, major sin. It is not any lesser than being a thief. May Allah protect us again is that. Here, if I say in Huda TV, we need to buy some cameras. So we raise fund. You generously donated. We bought the cameras. Can I keep one for myself? Can I say, well, because I'm the one who made the fund raise. I deserve one out of the four cameras. No. People donated this money for Huda TV. Not for any of us. Al-Waqfu ala niyat al-Waqf. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Sumaya from the UK, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about if a um, man and a woman, they commit zina, and the man is a Muslim and the woman is a Christian at that time, and after that she accepts Islam, mm. but um, they don't know that this, if they, uh, I mean, if they get married, they don't know if this, that this marriage is not uh, valid because the woman gets pregnant at that time. So what these people have to do? I mean, they have to get fact married again and number repent one. Allah or what they yeah. need? To do? Fact number one. Fact number one. It is not permissible for a couple who committed adultery to get married unless if they both repent. And when a non-Muslim woman gets involved in the act of fornication with a Muslim man and she accepts Islam, that's tawbah. Now the man needs to repent sincerely by regretting that he was involved in such an illicit relationship. He wishes that he, it didn't have happened. And also beg Allah for sincere tawbah and for forgiveness and promises that he will not do it again. When the tawbah is sincere, they can remarry. What if she is pregnant? According to the vast majority of the scholars, it's not permissible for them to marry while she's pregnant. Then after she gives birth, they can marry if they both repented. Thank you. And it is time to take a short break. We'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the final segment in today's program of Ask Uda. We have Mas'ud from UEE. Welcome to Ask Uda, Mas'ud. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What is your question, Mas'ud? Okay, my question is, uh, Sheikh, I visited a park uh, for recreational purpose few days ago, which was 120 to 140 kilometers away from my house. Now, I had mosques around me, so I could pray easily. Now, my question is, in this case, uh, am I required to shorten and combine the prayers, or should I pray the full salah? Thank you. How far was the park from your house? It was 120 kilometers, you can say. Okay. May I ask you another question? Like, you know, your city limit, or where we say we are in that city, once you leave it, from the moment you left your city to the park, how many kilos, kilometers? Uh, so I live in UAE. Yeah. Let's say so basically when I left the city that is Dubai, so I left the city from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. Okay. How many kilometers from the moment that you left Dubai to Abu Dhabi? How many kilometers? It is uh, approximately 130. That comes to 130 kilometers. But I thought you said the park was 120. From your house the, to the, the park. The whole uh, traveling... Yeah, the whole traveling distance is 130 kilometers approximately. Oh, okay, okay. I will answer you, inshallah, akhi. 
Of course, it's a beautiful thing to have fun, to go to the park, to take your family, sometimes to barbecue, to go fishing, to go hiking, enjoy your time. As long as, alhamdulillah, you're doing it from halal money, you're lowering your gaze, you're not going out with the aura being exposed, enjoy your fun time, this is perfectly halal. And when you are reciting to your adhkar in the car and the park, here and there, you're also rewarded as well. And you as a family father will be rewarded for providing halal fun for your family and for spending money for that cause. If once you leave your city, the distance to whichever destination you're going to is equivalent to 83 kilometers or more, MashaAllah, go ahead and shorten the prayers. And according to the vast majority of the scholars, with the exception of Imam Abu Hanifa, you can also combine two prayers at the time of either one of them, which share the same daytime or nighttime. In other words, i.e., you can combine Zuhr and Asr because they share the daylight, and Maghrib and Isha because they share the night time. So if you went to the park and it was already Dhuhr time, you can pray Dhuhr two rak'ahs, then you make Iqama and you pray Asr two rak'ahs, and then you don't have any commitment until the evening, where you can also, if you're still traveling, can pray Maghrib and Isha combined. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Samira from the UK, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Samira, go ahead. Okay, I have three questions. My yeah. first question is, if you recite Surah as Safat on Fridays, will you, be will you be protected from evil and diseases? Surat? As-Safat. Surat As-Saf? As-Safat? No, there's no one. As-Safat. Yeah. As-Safat, or safat safa correct? Yeah. Okay, I don't have any reference, or at least I do not recall reading or knowing any reference with regards to the verses of reciting Surah As-Safat upon traveling, receiving full protection. But I'm fully aware that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited the following dua after looking at the sky, smiling, making takbir three times, and he said, Allahumma inna nas'aluka fi safarina hadha al-birra wa taqwa wa min al-amali ma tarda Allahumma hawin alayna safarana hadha wa tuwi'anna bu'da Allahumma anta al-sahibu fi al-safar wa al-khalifatu fi al-ahl Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min wa'tha al-safar wa ka'abat al-manzar wa su'i al-munqalabi fi al-mali wa al-ahli wa al-walad and the translation to this beautiful dua will be posted in the comment bar, insha'Allah, on my Facebook page. So this is a supplication which will provide you with protection. Also, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, if you were to leave your house, upon leaving your house, if you were to say, Bismillah tawakkaltu ala Allah la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an adilla aw udal, aw azilla aw uzal, أو أظلم أو أظلم أو أجهل أو يجهل علي. so Allah the Almighty will tell such person who did that, who did that, who did. you've been rightly guided, and you have sufficient guidance and guardianship and protection from Allah. who did also means being protected. upon riding your car, your plane, or horseback riding. سبحان الذي سخر لنا هذا وما كنا له مقرنين وإنا إلى ربنا لمنقلبون. These are the supplications which, if we're leaving for a travel, I would recite. Thank you. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. سميرة, I heard that you have another question or maybe more. I have just two more. بسم الله بسم الله. Go ahead. I'm listening. Okay. Okay, so my question, second question is, when you're like touching a tafsir or if you're touching the Hisnul Muslim book, do you need to have wudu? Do you need to be in a state of purity? It is better, but it is not necessary. It is not required. Okay, last, last question. Um, if you make dua on the, on the night of Eid, is that a time of dua acceptance? Well, um, 
there are some opinions which say that it is known as the night of the reward. Okay? But there is no special worship prescribed on that night to the extent that we don't even pray uh, taraweeh anymore. But it is simply the conclusion of the blessed month of Ramadan. This is as far as Eid al-Fitri, obviously. So hopefully your dua will be accepted as it is the conclusion of your fasting. Uh, let's take the next caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Kareem from Germany, the final caller for the day. Assalamu alaikum Kareem. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Kareem. كيف حالك يا أخوان؟ الحمد لله. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Go ahead. الحمد لله. The first, I want to thank you for your effort. My my English is not good. I am sorry. I want to be a preacher of Islam in Germany. What should I do? What are the books you guide me to read? What can I do to help other people to get into Islam. I am Egyptian, but now I am live in Germany. So you speak Dutch? Do you speak Dutch? Uh, nicht gut. Uh. Okay, well, let me tell you this. Even if your Dutch is, uh, you know, uh, poor, we can definitely utilize you in our da'wah program and we can give you some training, but you'll be given da'wah online, insha'Allah Azza Jal. Please leave your contact with the control, and we'll be happy, insha'Allah, to contact you and give you some training as how to give da'wah online, insha'Allah. Brothers and sisters, anyone who's interested in giving da'wah, there are procedures and techniques. Whether you speak English, French, Spanish, or German, we'll be more than happy to assist you, inshallah. We have a huge da'wah platform, it's called Huda Chat. By the grace of Allah, by the grace of Allah, and only in the last couple of years, we have 24,000 plus new Muslims from 86 different countries. So if any of you is interested to join our da'wah program, We'll be more than happy, inshallah, to interview you, then also put you in a training course so you can uh, send a request on my Facebook page or the YouTube channel, inshallah, in today's episode, and we'll try to reach you afterward, inshallah. Leave your contact, your email address or phone number. We'll do whatever it takes to reach you, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayran, and we ask Allah the Almighty, to pardon us and forgive us all our sins and our shortcomings and to guide us to what is best and to keep us rightly guided on his right path. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah is my heart speaking Allah is my heart